Welcome to the Beano Chair Lecture Series. Um, most of you know me, I'm Dr. Oliver, and I've been asked by the Beano Series Chair to introduce Dr. David Bailey. Prior to doing that, I just want to mention that on Thursday, April 13th at 1 p.m., uh, Dr. Maida Chesney Lynn, whose area is juvenile delinquency, will also be here to wrap up this academic year's Beano Chair Series lecture. So she'll be here to lecture on juvenile delinquency. So we ask that you also attend that one as well. But when uh, Dennis asked me to introduce uh, Dr. Bailey, I was quite pleased and honored to do that. I looked through his uh, vita and his resume, biography, et cetera. And uh, it was kind of neat. I always look to see what kind of things I have in common. And I found that there were three things I have in common. One, I'm married with kids. <laughs> and that's important to me, at least. Uh, second is, is that we're both political scientists, teaching in criminal justice and specializing in policing. So I thought that was pretty neat. So, so they have home. Home. <laughs> well, yeah, okay. You know, it fits, right? <laughs> and the third is that everything he's written, I've read. <laughs> I was sitting there going through, going, I've read that, I've read that, I've read that. So I'm quite familiar with his work, so it's a pleasure to finally be able to meet you. Uh, a little bit more background. He is a distinguished professor in the School of Criminal Justice, State University of New York at Albany, otherwise known as shorthand SUNY Albany. Uh, he was the dean there of the School of Criminal Justice from 1995 to 1999. His area of specialization, I said, is policing, but predominantly it's been international policing, and that has been a big emphasis of his career. Um, he's been to and done extensive research in such places as India. That was before India became cool to do research in. He's done research in Japan, Australia, Canada, Bosnia, Britain, Singapore, and as well as in the United States. Um, he's also done a lot within the U.S. in terms of police departments. For instance, working with local PDs such as Grand Rapids, Michigan, all the way up to the New York Police Department. Um, He's currently a member, oh, step back. He's also done consulting work for the U.S. government with U.S. Department of Justice, Police Executive Research Forum, Vera Institute. He's on the advisory panels on Latin American policy and policing, and I can just go on and on and on. That one runs forever. Um, he's also involved with the United Nations and in particularly with the police reform in Bosnia. So he's been active with the Bosnia, Bosnian police. Uh, he's a, currently a member of the International Oversight Commission for the Reform of Police in Northern Ireland. Um, he's recently written the United Nations Program for Community Policing and the Rebuilding and Reform of Police and Peacekeeping Operations, which is predominantly now one of his areas. Not only has he been invited here to speak at Sam Houston under the Beta Lecture Series, he's also been an invited lecturer at ACJS, the Academy of Criminal Justice Sciences, the International House of Japan, and most recently, Rutgers University and the Crime and Misconduct Commission in Queensland, Australia, back in February of 2005. And he also is a former Beto lecturer, coming here in 1997, 1998. Okay. So he's coming for a return engagement. So we must have served him well then because he decided to actually come back. So that's a okay. good. <laughs> Most recently, his book, his most recent book of his many books, of which I've read all of them, <laughs> and actually, I just recently finished this one. So, um, the most recent book is Changing the Guard, Developing Democratic Police Abroad, October of 2005, published by Oxford University Press. In it is basically a four-year culmination of his research on international policing and how the United States has been involved in international peacekeeping, um, et cetera. Uh, one of the other books, well, many books, was What Works in Policing in 98, and a book that was written in 90, or published in 94 called Police for the Future still holds true today. I mean, everything in that book still could be read as if it was written yesterday. So still also a fabulous book, among many others. I could go on, but um, at this point I will, well, I guess I should mention this. Also many awards. Distinguished Professor at SUNY Albany, Fellow of the American Society of Criminology, Bruce Smith Award for the Academy of Criminal Justice Science for outstanding scholarship in the criminal justice field. So, Dr. David Bailey, 
We should be very honored to have him here, and it's my pleasure to now introduce him and turn the floor over to him. Thank you. Good afternoon. And uh, Will, thank you very much for the generous introduction. My mother would be pleased. She'd probably also be a little surprised. Uh, and I didn't have to pay Will for the plug on the book, uh, but it does make a wonderful Christmas gift for all of your family. Uh, it's an honor to come back and to be asked uh, to give the Beto Lecture. And it's also a great pleasure for personal reasons because I see in the audience people I know and have worked with and I consider friends from past years. So this is, this is an enjoyable experience for me. By the way, is this, tech, is this uh, technological thing working? Are you getting the right sound back there and everybody's hearing and good? All right. Um, the, the title of today's lecture is America's Role in International Criminal Justice Description and Assessment. And my thesis is quite simple, and it is this that criminal justice has now penetrated American foreign policy. It is one of the core elements of American foreign policy at the moment. You are all used to studying criminal justice within the domestic American context. And my message to you is it's off the reservation and has expanded a good deal in your lifetime. And what I want to do this afternoon is first of all to describe the internationalization of criminal justice and how it's become a core element of American foreign policy. And as I comment on how this has come about, I want then to say something about why this constitutes a problem for the United States. In other words, what are some of the difficulties of having criminal justice embedded in your foreign policy? Now, I'm going to look at the, uh, the, the internationalization of criminal justice in, in uh, under three dimensions. The first dimension is America's efforts at joint cr uh, crime fighting abroad. That is fending off criminal threats from the external world. Secondly, the development, the America's participation in the development of international institutions of criminal justice. And third, our involvement in reforming and reconstructing criminal justice abroad, that is projecting democratic criminal justice into other lands. These, I think, are the three strands of criminal justice as American foreign policy, and I'm going to tell you what they constitute and why they may be difficult. The first has to do with um, international crime fighting. Now, we, we're not new to this. We started uh, working, we started thinking about criminal threats from the external world uh, on America way back in the 18th century with the Barbary pirates. But in the last 15 years especially, this has expanded a great deal. And if you now go into an American embassy abroad, they will tell you, and you say you're interested in criminal justice, they will say America has four problems of crime that emanate from abroad that constitute security threats to us. And they are terrorism, drugs, trafficking in people, and, it, and the protection of intellectual property rights. This is now a mantra. And people in American embassies across the world will tell you that this, these are our concerns in terms of crime. There are various agencies that are now playing a role abroad in protecting an America from these and I would say some other problems as well. Notably two major agencies are the FBI and the DEA. The FBI now has offices in 59 countries. It has more offices abroad than it has in the United States. It only has 56 field offices in the United States. The DEA operates in 62 countries with 86 offices. And in the United States, it, there, we, the DEA has more offices at home than it does abroad. But besides the FBI and the DEA, who now, and there are people in both of these agencies who specialize in operating abroad. It has become a career track in both of these agencies. But then there are other ones. Uh, there's the INS, uh, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, Agriculture, Customs and Excise, Commerce, EPA. There are a lot of federal agencies that now station people routinely abroad to collect information about crime emanating from abroad <clears throat> and working with locals to, uh, to prevent it. Now, what do we do? when we operate abroad. 
A lot of these things are the same things we would do at home. We just do it with foreign collaborators. Criminal investigations jointly undertaken. We, uh, we work on working with foreigners to spot uh, suspects and, to cap and, 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 and fugitives, and then, of course, to extradite them. We share information worldwide through Interpol, and we participate increasingly in cross-national task forces on all of the four sorts of crime that I mentioned. The, um, that's first, that's first that, that's number one under what are we doing abroad in terms of fighting crime. It's kind of traditional crime fighting, but abroad. The second thing we do is we are now engaged in extensive training of people abroad in criminal justice. And this is across the board, corrections, courts, and most especially the police. And we, we do this in a couple of ways. I don't know whether you know, but America now has, has and it has had since 1995, uh, five, what are now five, International Law Enforcement Academies. Uh, the first one was established in Budapest in 1995. The next one was run, is run, and that's run by the FBI. There is one in Bangkok, 1997, if memory serves right. There is one in Botswana, Africa, run by the Marshall Service. There is a new one just starting in Latin America in El Salvador, and there is the one that you people participate in in Roswell, New Mexico, which is kind of a graduate institute. For, uh, uh, for people in criminal justice. And since 1995, we have trained in these various offshore police training facilities, although they involve prosecutors sometimes as well. We've trained over 16,000 people from foreign countries in American methods of management, crime detection, and the like. In addition, we bring every year 11,000 people to the United States for training in domestic institutions uh, across the board, again, from corrections to police. Training of people abroad by us is now a huge international undertaking. And the third thing we do in terms of crime fighting abroad is we try to encourage foreign countries to adopt some of the legal techniques and the legal regimes and the crime investigating techniques that we believe are very important, such as the, the, the RICO statute, wiretapping, asset forfeiture, which we invented, uh, drug sting operations, covert penetration, and the use of informants. Now, we have worked out laws and policies for the, conduction, for, for the conduct of all these kinds of activity. And what we are now doing is trying to influence other countries to adopt similar laws and procedures so that we can work more easily with them. Now, we believe that these methods which we, that, that are stock and trade in the United States will also benefit foreign countries as well. But it also makes it easier for us to understand and to cooperate with them if they are operating within the same legal framework. So the kind of projection of American law abroad in crucial areas is now an important component of what these agents that I've referred to are doing abroad. Now, the problems with this, and there are three. The first is, there is growing resentment around the world of our pressing the rest of the world to fight our battles, uh, uh, to fight our battles on their home territory. And there is considerable resentment, especially in Europe, about the, these laws, especially things like RICO, wiretapping, use of informants, and asset forfeiture. The Europeans at the moment have laws that are more restrictive in all of these areas than ours. And so we find ourselves in a very interesting position. That on the one hand, we say we are models of, of democratic criminal justice. And the Europeans are saying, hang on a minute. We don't think you are. And we have the Helsinki Declaration of Human Rights and the European Code of Human Rights and so forth. And they are saying, we think we have higher standards of human rights than you do. So there is resentment on the one hand, because in, in some of these cases we have been, we've been fairly tough with some of these countries. And we've said, unless you cooperate in certain ways, 
of the sort that I've indicated, we may not, you know, we, we, we may not give you certain foreign aid, we may not allow certain technology to flow in your direction. We've been a little, we've, we've twisted some arms. And we are beginning to find, as I say, especially in Europe, consider, and in Canada, some resistance. Uh, there has also been the second element of this, and I indicated to you, this to you. Some countries are beginning to say, you are paying, you are looking for us, as I said, to fight your battles. We would like your help in making our people safer. Uh, and the, the big bugaboo for many countries, especially in Latin America, is America's drug policy. And they keep saying to us increasingly, that we ought to be fighting drugs by adopting a demand reduction strategy in the United States, rather than emphasizing quite as much as we've done, crop eradication and interdiction of the flow of drugs from Latin American countries to the United States. The Latin Americans are also very concerned with the flow of weapons, by the way, I mean handguns, from the United States into Latin America. And they would like help in stopping that and so far, the Commerce Department of our government has not seen fit to do that. So there is concern then, both because there's pressure and also because people are saying we are exporting our law enforcement efforts that should better be concentrated here at home and perhaps supplemented with a demand reduction strategy. By the way, there was a Nobel laureate in uh, Latin America, whose name I can't remember at the moment, who actually circulated a petition about 10 years ago saying that what Latin American countries ought to do is to legalize the international trade in narcotics. Not to internationalize or not to legalize the use of narcotics domestically in Bolivia and Venezuela and Colombia, but to allow them to flow through and to tax them. And if there's a market in the United States, the notion was that's our problem. It's not their problem. Now, this hasn't gone anywhere, and as you can imagine, we fought it like mad. But there is growing resentment of this sort uh, in parts of the world. And as I've already indicated, there is, some, there is some loss, I think, of moral standing. Reagan used to like to say that we are the, the shining city on the hill uh, in terms of democratic and human rights standards. And there are now countries, especially after the, in the war on drugs, that are now beginning to look at us and say perhaps we are not that shining example with respect to law and human rights that we think we are. And so there is a, a growing kind of undercurrent of resentment at the same time that we clearly face threats of, of a security nature to the United States. The second dimension that I want to discuss is the construction and America's role in the construction of international criminal justice institutions. We are, since roughly 1991, I would say, we are developing fairly robust institutions, multilateral international institutions of criminal justice. And let me just sketch those in very briefly. Um, and these are, occur under the auspices of the United Nations. First is police. The United Nations now has a police, co police force. It's called UN CivPol, United Nations Civil Police. There are now 7,000 UN police persons with light blue berets stationed in nine missions around the world. Uh, they have contributions to that police force from over 40 nations. We contribute, the United States now sends about 500 police officers a year to the UN International Civilian Police Force. We, our high spot was in the year 2000 when we had about 850. And at the moment, we have another 500 Americans, police officers, deployed in Afghanistan and Iraq. Now that's not under international auspices, that's under our own, under the, uh, under the uh, Department of Justice. And police from all over the country in this 500 that I've mentioned now work for the United Nations. Uh, I know you've had some from Houston, I know you've had some from Dallas. Local law enforcement officials are now finding this as a nice second career. Uh, now some of the places that they go may not be all that nice, like Liberia and Sierra Leone and so forth, uh, but it is, it, 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 it's a, uh, an opportunity for adventure that local cops may not have had uh, when they were doing traffic duty and so forth in the United States. 
the, not only has the United Nations police force grown, and I think it's going to continue to grow, it has also taken on new responsibilities. Uh, Fifteen years ago, all that the UN police people did was to monitor what was going on in these troubled regions of the world, and then to report on it, say, look, terrible things are happening here, somebody ought to do something about it. They then moved from that into advising local criminal justice systems on how to improve. Thirdly, they developed into trainers and to the providers of equipment. And since, nine, since 1999, the UN police force has gotten what is called executive police authority. They are armed and they can make arrests. And this happened first in uh, Kosovo and then it happened in um, um, East Timor. Uh, I think there's an African country where that's happening now, but I'm not quite sure. The point is, this police force, which used to be quite passive in its activities, is now capable of the sort of police actions that you would expect out of local law enforcement here in Huntsville or in Houston. That's on the police side. But there is another element to this, and that's international courts have now grown. Um, first is that there are international criminal tribunals for, uh, in The Hague, uh, The Hague for Yugoslavia, in Tanzania for Rwanda, uh, that are now investigating crimes against humanity and genocide and trying to bring the perpetrators to justice. There is also the International Criminal Court, which became operative in, 19, in the year 2004. We have not joined it. I'll make a comment about that later. Uh, and this is a court which can prosecute individuals for crimes against humanity and genocide. There is something you people have also heard of which is called the World Court. Don't confuse the two. The World Court has existed since, I think, the League of Nations, and it adjudicates disputes between states. And what the United Nations and the international community has not had is a court that could preside over people that it arrested and then adjudicated. That's changed, and it's changed only in the last few years. And lastly, we may have embryonically the beginning of an international correction system. We have a prison now in The Hague for holding people. It's very small at the moment, uh, but it is the beginning. And so what you see under UN and international auspices is all the three aspects of criminal justice are now beginning to be invented and with some strength at the international level. Now, there are two problems that this movement causes for the United States. First is the International Criminal Court. I've mentioned to you that we have not joined that. 100 and I think it's 102 nations have signed off on it. The United States has not and we won't. Uh, and the problem here is that what, what, what the administration has feared is that we, because we have so many people abroad, that they might be charged frivolously with crimes against humanity uh, or genocide and then arrested, held under international auspices and prosecuted by the International Criminal Court. The counter argument to that is that this particular treaty setting this up says that, that, a, that if one, in an American, if an American is believed to have committed these offenses, the American criminal justice system gets first crack. And if the American criminal justice system doesn't do justly with that person, covers it up, excuses the person, then it goes to the International Criminal Court. So my own view is, this is just my own personal view, is my own view is we will have that person at home and there would be no com way to, that, the, that the international community could compel us to give that person up. But nonetheless, it is a f it, there is a fear in the United States that this could be used internationally to embarrass us and some of the people that we have sent abroad. But there is another aspect to this that I think is probably uh, more troublesome for many people, and that is that we now have the elements of world government. If you think what is essential to government, surely it is the protection of your country from external threats and the maintenance of order internally through a criminal justice system. This is, this is the guts of government. And you now find for the first time that the United Nations has developed this essential capacity. The United Nations also has an army. It's 60,000 person strong. 
Um, so for the first time, the UN begins to look like a world government. That's very troubling to a great many Americans. And if some of you have read some of the literature, there is stuff that is done by, by people on, shall I say, a particular fringe in the United States who are always talking about the UN's black helicopters flying over the United States and doing nefarious things. Now, the, now and you could laugh about this. The point is, I don't think they're flying over the United States and doing nefarious things, and they're not black, they're white. There are white helicopters. And, and white vehicles and white airplanes and so forth. But they're not operating here, but they are operating in other countries. And so the people who are concerned about our sovereignty and whether this movement might curtail our sovereignty is, is, it, it is a serious concern. And this explains why we have not gone along with the other 102 nations in, uh, in supporting the uh, International Criminal Court. There is another movement, by the way. Not only is there uh, uh, international institutions of, of criminal justice at the UN level, but in the, uh, it's being done regionally as well. And the, the, the big experiment there is with the European Union, uh, which now is beginning to get uh, a unified criminal code, uh, rules for the exchange of police personnel, for common training, uh, for uh, regulations for prisons and so forth. So there's a lot going on outside of the United States in terms of creating formal institutions of criminal justice on an international basis. Thirdly, the third dimension of American activity is international criminal justice reconstruction and reform. And we are engaged in this around the world, not simply in Afghanistan, and in Iraq, which preoccupies us every day, but in other sorts of places. We are doing this sort of activity, meaning we're going into countries and helping them to reform or reestablish institutions of criminal justice. And we're doing this in four sorts of places. The first sort are in what I will call reforming states. Those are states which are undergoing a largely peaceful process of shifting from dictatorship to democracy, from communism to democracy, and so forth. Such places as the USSR, Romania, South Africa, Poland, Hungary, all of these in your lifetime, and I'm looking at the, not the older ones in the audience, but the students in the audience, in your lifetime, this has all started. Um, and, and, and these efforts in these countries have been going on. That's the first. Then there are the conflicted societies. The ones that are having uh, 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 outbreaks of civil war and in some cases genocide. El civil war, for example, in El Salvador, Bosnia, Kosovo, East Timor. And that's another place where we have intervened, sometimes alone, but sometimes with other countries, in order to uh, reestablish order. Then there are what, are what the State Department calls failed states. States where anarchy has replaced orderly government, where in fact there is no government, but it's a war of all against all. And those places are like Darfur, now in Sudan, where in effect there is no effective government. Um, in Liberia, Sierra Leone, both in West Africa, Somalia, Cambodia, their government simply ceased and somebody had to come in to stop mass killing. And lastly, a fourth category, and we invented this category, the United States, we'll call them states that have been made to fail. This is, these are places where we especially have decided that the regime constituted such a serious threat to the United States that even though it was a, an existing government capable of maintaining order, we felt it as a threat to ourselves. And there were several of those. Grenada under Reagan, you may remember. Panama and the overthrow of Noriega under Bush one. And now under Bush II, Afghanistan had a government. You may not have liked the Taliban. It was a government. And, of course, Saddam Hussein in Iraq. In all of these cases, we decided these were governments that should fail because of what they were doing, either to their own people or to ourselves. So these are the four kind of arenas in which America has been engaged in reinventing, reestablishing, and reforming criminal justice. And it is, a, it is a huge operation. I estimate that we're spending probably in the, in the, in the, in the, in the range of $750 million a year 
on these kinds of developmental criminal justice activities abroad. And I'm not talking about Afghanistan and Iraq. That's, that's another matter. But done under the ordinary foreign affairs budget of the United States. Now, other countries are involved in this too. Much of Europe is. Israel is involved in this. Japan, Australia, New Zealand. So we're not alone in doing this. Um, and if, uh, if you count what we're spending on this in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, it's now up into the billions uh, of money that we're spending on the reestablishment of fundamental institutions of justice. Um, there are, one of the things I should point out, that in all of these international um, agencies that are doing this work, as well as, as well as our agencies operating abroad, there are careers for you people. Think about that. I mean, you don't you shouldn't think of that the future out of out of Sam Houston is that you join the corrections department of of, of Houston, Texas, uh, or Denton, or wherever it is. You can think more broadly and find yourself abroad, either for a federal in or or an international agency. And I have a student now. His name is Adam Balukas, who was uh, a PhD of my school ten years ago who's now the, the Deputy Director for Criminal Justice Development in Afghanistan, presiding over an annual budget of $415 million. And I look at Adam and I think, where did you learn to spend $415 million? Not in my classes, I can tell you. But it's, it, you know, it's, it's an indication of what can happen uh, in, 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 in this projection of American criminal justice abroad. Now, just as in these other areas, there are some real problems for America in terms of doing reconstruction uh, abroad. One is that this involves nation building. And you may remember Bush II's uh, campaign for president in 2000 where he said the last thing we ought to be involved in is nation building. Bush II is now presiding in my judgment, over the largest nation-building activity that the United States has ever taken on. It's one of the great ironies of, 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 the, of the modern time, that we are in both of those countries, Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, are trying to establish from the ground up a workable, humane system of criminal justice. And this was exactly what George Bush, too, didn't want to do. And despite himself, he now finds himself in it. Um, the second thing, in other words, the, the question on the first one is, do we know enough to do nation building of this sort well in all of these four arenas that I've mentioned? The second point is that I do have some, some serious doubts about the way we're spending our money, not just in Afghanistan and, and Iraq, which in some ways are quite unique because they're done largely under the Department of Defense. Uh, and I'm, this isn't the criticism of the Department of Defense, it's the only institution we've got out there that's capable of projecting what we need on the ground. Um, my, but with respect to these, our normal foreign policy, State Department, USAID efforts at reconstruction, I think our efforts, we spend a lot of money, and in my judgment, we don't get enough from it. And I'm fond of saying that we often, in the United States, we have more money than sense. And I'm afraid it's this way in this case. We, by and large, my, my primary criticisms will be, are that we, we try to reconstruct abroad according to what we're doing here at home, not necessarily what they need and what fits the local culture. In other words, our efforts at reconstruction are very often what you would call a supply side exercise and not a demand side exercise, so that rather than responding to what those people and their historical institutions can handle, we say, do it our way. Do it the way we do it in Schenectady, or Sacramento, or Huntsville. And I think we've got to get smarter about planning what we do. The, the other thing in our projection of criminal justice abroad is that by and large we do this with federal expertise and not state and local expertise. And I think you all know, those of you who are in criminal justice, most criminal justice is practiced at the state and local level in the United States. That's where the expertise is. 
And yet the people we send abroad are often federal agents, FBI, DEA, and so forth. And the federal government has, for reasons we could discuss, has a lot of problems getting local people with, with experience in courts and corrections and police and sending them abroad. And so to some extent, we've got wonderful people and they're talented and well-meaning that we send abroad, but they may not have that full service criminal justice perspective that I think exists at the state and local level. And then lastly, we're not particularly well organized to do this at the federal level. And the problem basically is this, the Department of State has the money, but it knows very little about criminal justice. The Department of Justice knows a good deal about criminal justice, but it has not, it knows nothing about development of, of, of criminal justice institutions abroad. It is a law enforcement agency, and it does that job very well, but it doesn't know how to, to, to do development in the USAID sense. And there's the other big actor, US Agency for International Development uh, contains the experts on development. The problem is they don't know anything about criminal justice. So we've got these damn silos, you know, of money and expertise, and we're having problems sharing what is necessary. Money, expertise, foreign policy experience, and lastly, what is referred to as the surge capacity. That is the ability to send people of the right sort into these places quickly so that they can do the job that's needed. Now, the one agency in Washington that has surge capacity is the Department of Defense. And why is the Department of Defense often the 900 or the 800 pound gorilla in these areas? It's the only one who can get there. And the Department of Defense does a wonderful job, in my judgment, through some of its uh, MP battalions, through its civil affairs officers. But it needs, and of course, has trouble getting the state and local component expertise that I refer to. So here you've got money one place, and expertise another, and foreign policy experience another, and surge capacity in another place. And if we're going to be doing this job in the future, once, you know, even beyond Afghanistan and Iraq, if we're going to do this well, we've got a serious organizational problem in Washington. Okay, let me conclude and kind of sum things up. What I'm saying to you now is that criminal justice is front and center in our headlines. You can't read the Chronicle or the New York Times or any paper and not recognize that at the center of our problems in many parts of the world and certainly in Afghanistan and Iraq is criminal justice. It's, in other words, criminal justice has kind of gotten out of the neighborhood and it's gone global. Now, I think there are some implications, and there are implications for schools like yours and mine. Uh, our, does, does our curricula, do our curricula, reflect this globalization? Now, it may here in Sam Houston, and, I, and, and I've got to look at your curriculum, frankly, and haven't done so. You have in Dick Ward one of the true pioneers in this area. Dick has been, has been involved in the development of international criminal justice for years and years. And so I hope it has made a difference uh, to the curriculum, uh, but I haven't yet checked. I'll get to that later in the day. The other thing that has to happen, and I hope does happen, is that you people who are students in this program begin to, uh, begin to think more broadly of where a career in criminal justice might take you. Uh, it might even have you uh, presiding over a 400 million plus dollar budget in Afghanistan or something like that. It's quite amazing the careers that are available to you, both institutional and both internationally and in terms of American uh, 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 agencies that are now working abroad. So think about that. And as I say, there are more opportunities than I suspect that, um, that, that, that you are now thinking about. I think with respect to the study of criminal justice, we should begin to think about what I'm going to call the localities of where criminal justice is practiced and that our curricula ought to reflect criminal justice activities in these four localities. And these four localities are the following. First, of course, what's going on in the United States? That's traditional. 
It's what certainly the curriculum in my school, and I suspect here, is, is does mostly. But the second area is to ask comparatively what other countries are doing. How do other countries do the same, address the same problems that we have here? And be willing to learn from them. And it's one of the terrible, I think, indictments of our profession. And if you go into libraries and look for a book that says, give a, you go for a, a book that, that arrays the inventories of, of, uh, of, of drug policies around the world. I don't think it exists. Or gang policies around the world. You know, what does, what does Denmark do? What do the Netherlands do? What does Japan do? These things are not pulled together. And so name your particular topic. Go to the library and I'll bet you that you cannot find, except for an occasional article, you can't find a book, a reference manual that pulls these sorts of things together. In other words, we are not systematically learning from the rest of the world. I suspect it's because of the usual thing. We believe we're unique and what everybody else does has, you know, uh, doesn't apply to the United States. There is another country, though, that's a, that's a wonderful example of doing this, and that's Japan. Japan systematically, when a problem arises in Japan, will send people abroad to find out how other countries are handling this. I think it's way past time for the United States to be doing that. The third locality where criminal justice should be studied is interstate. Now that means when, when, when two countries, three countries, begin to form joint task force forces and work collaboratively. In other words, how does this interstate cooperation really go on? And at the moment, I think that's where most of the activity in the, of the American government is concentrated. And then fourth, the fourth locality is the creation of international, international, not interstate, but genuinely international institutions of criminal justice. These are the four localities where criminal justice is being practiced. And we need to raise our eyes, I think, from our domestic one to these other places. And so my challenge to you here, in conclusion, my challenge to you is first, certainly broaden the span of your study. And for some of you who are especially at doctoral stage, if you don't find the materials that we all believe ought to be there, write them. You know, come on in. There's nobody in there. The water's fine. Do it yourself. Secondly, take advantage of this in terms of careers. Do raise your eyes a bit and broaden your horizons. And thirdly, at least all of you, pay attention to this. Criminal justice is now a matter of world politics. It is central to world politics and to American foreign policy. It will haunt you, and these questions that I raise, these difficulties, are going to haunt you the rest of your life. This is not what's going on in Afghanistan and Iraq. This isn't just a one-off. We're going to be involved in all four of these activities for, for your entire lives. And so I say to you, these are issues, criminal justice issues, which I believe are going to shape the, the future of freedom in our world. And so I say to you, pay attention. This is the new frontier of criminal justice. Thank you. No, no, of course. All right, all right on the floor. If anybody has any questions, and uh, I'll let uh, David field them. Yeah, Larry. Hey, Larry. A threshold of political democratization must be met before the worthwhile investing in the democratization of the criminal justice processes in the state. Yes. This is, as you might expect, he's asked the most difficult question, the $64 million question. Um, you can't have a democratic criminal justice system without a democratic political system. Unfortunately, you're unlikely to get a democratic political system if you don't have the rudiments of a democratic criminal justice system. I mean, it is this, this reciprocal thing. I mean, and which comes first? And of course, they both have to happen at the same time. And that's the dilemma. I mean, I think the best you can say, I mean, I've never been able to say in my own mind 
what is, what's the absolute first thing you must do, the second thing, the third thing, and so forth. What I think you can say, are there certain places in the world which are so awful in terms of the political climate that anything you invest there is wasted? Yes. The answer is clearly yes. I mean, I would, I would argue now that, 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 that say, Sierra Leone or, Le, or, or Liberia. Um, now, look, I, I, gotta be, I maybe have to be careful. Let me choose another example. That, those aren't good cases because they don't really have governments. And, and, and if you, we could put a government in that place, that's probably money well spent because you're going to save a lot of lives. But are there countries where the political climate is now so awful that anything we do is swimming upstream? I think, I think uh, 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 Ukraine last year was such a case. I'm not sure about about Russia, as a matter of fact, at the moment, the degree to which we should invest in criminal justice there. Um, what are some of the other horror stories? Um, I think that I think that probably a lot of the countries in in the Middle East are they're not going to change uh, as a result of our bringing people to Budapest to an ILEA or bringing them here. I don't think so. Uh, so there are some, I, yeah, and I think some of the Central Asian places, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, I think it's wasted. Now, at the, now, when I say that, there's a, another, guy, uh, another person who works in this area, Tom Carruthers, at the Carnegie Institute. He says, while you shouldn't invest a lot of money in places where the whole political system is against you, it is worthwhile going and at least being a voice for a different model. And I think that's right. In other words, so that you would go there and, and, and at least speak to what democratic institutions of criminal justice look like, even though you're unwilling at the moment to invest a lot of money in creating them. And, and that, that makes some sense to me. So, so I, I suppose what I'm saying in answer to your question is it's, it's going to be different strokes for different folks. And somebody has to develop the skills to assess what you can accomplish reasonably at different levels of investment. Yes? Now, regarding your comments on nation building, uh, to what extent, if any, would you compare what's happening today, for instance, with the nation building efforts uh, post World War II in Japan, Germany, and uh, post war Europe, which, as I recall, roundly criticized in many times being too costly, uh, beyond their expertise, and unnecessary. You know, it's a real question in my mind whether in Germany and Japan we did nation building in the following sense. There were nations there. And they had deep historical traditions of government. They even had, certainly in Weimar Germany and to some extent in the 30s in Japan, they had the beginnings of, of, of democratic institutions. So what I, I only, what I think we had, in other words, these were coherent historical governmental places. Now, there are other countries now where I'm not sure you can say that, whether there is a nation and a, and a history to rely on, if you see what I'm saying. Now, coming to, to Afghanistan and Iraq, I, I, at this point, I'm, I'm tempted to say I'm too ignorant to talk, but I probably will talk anyhow. Um, <laughs> I mean, Iraq, to some extent, is a, you know, it was an artificial state made out of the decaying uh, Turkish Empire. Uh, to what extent, and, and really somebody else is going to have to answer that, is that a, you know, is that a, is that a nation? Maybe it's three nations, Shiite, Sunni, and Kurd. You see, that's the problem. You're, we not, didn't, you're not discounting, of course, the, the modern German state having reformed. Yeah, but you see, one of my point is, where, where in, in Iraq, we're not sure there's a nation. In Germany, there was a nation. Japan, there was a nation. There wasn't, you know, it wasn't going to split into civil war. It was a question of what kind of government you were going to have. And so what we did, I guess, I, I guess the phrase is, we built governments in both of those places and provided the, the infrastructure to support those governments. But, and maybe I'm quibbling over the word nation building, but we didn't really have to create a nation out of nothing. 
Now, I think Afghanistan, from what I know, is probably a coherent nation, was at one time. You see the problem. Yeah. Yes. Well, can I ask you about the uh, United Nations police force uh, you alluded to, and uh, that they're, they're actually armed and going in and making arrests? What countries are they operating in, and when are they coming here? <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, they, they, they've done this in Kosovo, East Timor, and I think it's, it's either Liberia or Sierra Leone. I think it's Liberia at the moment, where they wear weapons. Um, the, um, there's, I'm, I'm going to build on something that you've said. One of the interesting questions about this, and, and in mind, there are nine missions, uh, nine United Nations police missions. They only have police powers in three, and in the other six, they don't. They can't make arrests, and they're not armed. In the places where they can, the question is, what law do they arrest people under? Think about it. And this is a question for us in, in, in Iraq. What law do we apply if we arrest people? American law? International law? Saddam's law? British law from the 1920s? You see the problem. Uh, and this is such a large problem, as a matter of fact, that right now, and this is something perhaps I should have mentioned, there is a working group that's been put together. There's an Irish university, I think it's Galway University, and and, and, and a think tank in Washington, and there's another, that are actually drafting what is called a portable international criminal code. You see, that's what you need. You need, you know, if you're going to send people in there from, from an international institution, and, and they're going to have law enforcement powers, the question is, what law is going to regulate that? And at the moment, there isn't one. And what they're going to try to do, and this is, this is happening now. That's what's so interesting about all of this. That they are now in the process. There's a draft of the first portable international criminal code. See, we have international law. International law applies to states largely and now to genocide and, and, and that sort of thing. But it doesn't have to do with burglary and rape and grievous bodily harm and that sort of stuff. And that's what the UN police force now is capable of arresting people for. But it hasn't got a code that it can use. Well, aside from the laws that they would enforce or where you get the laws, where did they get their authority to do anything? They got it from something called the world community. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I know. <laughs> That's right. Look, I mean, look, this is, this is all growing like topsy right in front of us. And, and the, authority, I mean, the authority legally comes out of the United Nations and specifically the Security Council. It comes through regulation or through for resolutions of the Security Council. Now, for many people, that's fine, and other people say, oh my God, you know, <laughs> please not. Uh, that's where we are. So all this authority for the UN police, the courts, the tribunals, all of that, it's UN resolutions or treaties. There are some treaties that, that precede the United Nations. You mentioned the uh, International Criminal Court and the, uh, the U.S. does not participate yeah. in it. And one of the things that struck me was that the, uh, but you also may talk about how the Europeans are having problems with the U.S. coming over, going over there and sort of telling them what to do. But that's one of the problems that you didn't emphasize as much, which is this sort of the, the idea of the exceptional status that the U.S. reserves for itself. The International Criminal Court is one of them. The, the, uh, the, the environmental protocols I guess, is another example that you're getting into something else. But that's part of where the, uh, where the resentment is coming from. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, we, look, I, here I think is, is our dilemma. I think we are increasingly going to be faced with threats to our security from abroad. Terrorism, drugs, pe people uh, trafficking, all of that. And these are real problems. And what we need is clearly a coalition of the willing. And how, you know, what do, how do we go about getting these people, you know, the rest of the world and, and us with the rest of the world operating under some regulated, humane, accountable system of law. 
and the agencies of law. That's, that, that's it. And, I, and that's why I say to all of you, this problem is not going to go away. It is going to grow more intense. And we are, we, and, and, and at the moment, we're sending conflicting signals. On the one hand, on the, we're reaching out with one hand and we say, we need your help against terrorism and drugs. Please, help us and we'll help you. On the other hand, we're saying, but not in the environment, not with respect to the export of weapons, and not with respect to the world, uh, the International Criminal Court. And that's just, look, that, uh, that's just where we are. That's the state of our political discourse. Don't you think it's ironic that the U.S. is playing super cop sort, being the little superpower now, and yet they refuse to uh, be submitted to the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court? Like, there are some opinions to the effect that uh, the United Kingdom is also uh, subjected to the same threat, but you know, they no. assigned to the they uh, agree to the Rome Statute, and there are some comments that there are efforts on the part of the U.S. to force the signatories to the Rome Statute. To execute a bilateral treaty with the United States, except Look, you have to just admit it. We're the only developed democracy, I believe, that is not signed on to the International Criminal Court. Now, there will be people in the United States, probably people in this audience, who say, "Good. So what? Fine." I mean, this is a serious question that we're addressing. Personally, I believe that that our people abroad are protected sufficiently. And I would like to see us move toward a, a, a regime in the world where people who, look, it's against, it's against crimes against humanity and genocide. Do we really have a problem morally with prosecuting people who do that? Now, they've got to be real prosecutions, there's got to be accountability, there's got to be regularity in law, all of that. Um, so, you know, kind of morally, I'd like to see this. Can we make it work so that it isn't, this authority isn't abused in some way? I think we can. A lot of people who I, you know, who I respect, think we can. One more question. Yes, in the back, and then I'll, I'll come to you too. This group is developing the uh, international code. This group is developing the international code. Are they doing the laws as well? Sorry, you got to speak louder. Uh, this group is developing the international criminal code. Yeah. Are they developing juvenile? Good question. I can't answer it. I would think so, simply because that's a stock part of, you know, criminal codes. My guess is the answer to that is yes, but check it. I mean, go to Google. <laughs> you know, yeah, good question. Yes. You had it. Okay. And then I'll go to the back, too. Go ahead. Uh, this is a totally different topic. Um, I'm a South Korean police officer. Just like Japan sends a lot of their public officials to run all over the world, yeah. South Korea does. Yes, you That's do. That's why I came here five years ago, and then I studied the criminal justice uh, with the United States. When I first uh, started my study, especially in policing area, there are a lot of these articles and a lot of buzzwords about policing, community policing. Now, I've been here for five, five years. Now, nowadays, they talk a lot about Comes the policing and a little bit of zero tolerance. They, I don't see they are necessarily opposite, but it seems like the direction is moving from community policing to comes that matter. Now, from my perspective, my personal perspective, I've been a police officer in South Korea for 10 years. What they were doing is that there was community policing. Uh, you wrote this uh, orders of uh, forces of order and you describe the Japanese person very, very well. And what Korea does is exactly the same. So they uh, keep a very close tie between police and the community. For example, let's say a patrol officer, Kim, he drives his patrol car a day, and maybe he, he, has, he has to be stopped by citizens at least six times a day. And what the citizens ask for him is, hey, Officer Kim, come over here. Let's take a, a drink a cup of coffee together and they talk, or these citizens, they uh, invite those police officers to their home, and sometimes they drink a beer together. What they are doing is, I think, community policing. Now, here in the States, what I saw was all these police department, they set up an office with the name of Community Policing Unit, Community Policing Division. 
there is these programs, a lot of these uh, things, but the culture is not quite very different. Are and you? now they are they are saying that community policing doesn't work, so we're going to change it, the direction to. Are you kind of asking what's happened to community policing in the United States? What is going to happen? Community policing. Okay, <laughs> there is. <laughs> You know, he's quite right that 10 years ago, 15 years ago, the paradigm of American policing was community policing. I now have an article on my desk, and the title of it is Paradigm Lost, which is a great title. Uh, and, and, and this person is making the argument that and your perception is right, that I don't think American police forces are talking a lot about community policing at all. It is the flavor of, of, of the last decade. We're now talking about evidence-based policing, intelligence-led policing. Those, that's, that's the new paradigm of policing. Um, now, um, and, and, if, and, and even in the heyday of policing, or of community policing, what was being practiced in the United States varied enormously. And I don't know whether you know, but about seven years ago, the US Department of Justice did a survey they asked American police departments on a random sample basis, what are you doing community policing? 95% of them said, yeah, we're doing it. They said, okay, what are you doing? They had to have 34, as I remember, 34 categories to describe what American police forces were doing. And then the question was, so, so in other words, it was, me, it was 34 different things. Then the question was, well, is there a central tendency here? In other words, are, are most of them doing one or two things? And what they discovered was that the es essence of community policing in the United States was two things. It was having beat patrol officers. Two, it was having an officer designated as a crime prevention officer. Now look, if you know anything about American policing, that's been going on for 100 years, practically. There's no police force in the United States that doesn't have beat police officers. And, and, and with various degrees, you know, some variation, somebody designated as a crime prevention officer. So that what this indicated was that what, you know, we were talking a good game, but it was very superficial. And it certainly never got to any, to the degree of seriousness of what was going on in South Korea or Japan. And now, I mean, I think it's fair to say, I mean, as I'm looking at this now, I think I think that even these slender roots are, are, are withering and that we're moving into a new, a new era uh, where I have a feeling that intelligence-led policing situated in specialized units are going to become more important than the beat patrol officer, uniform beat patrol officer. This is, I'm talking right off the top of my head and I can be totally wrong. But that's what I think is going on. And so I think your appreciation of you came here and have been surprised, I think, yeah, I understand that. I think it reflects what's going on. Now, there was one question in the back. And then, well, all right, well, I'll get to you. All right. If, if you people can stand it, there are two more hands here waving around. <clears throat> yeah. Well, I would like to get your view on this. My, my feeling is that there is no separation between justice criminal justice and foreign policy, as it applies to those countries that are hostile to the United, to the United States. But in this case, we have in Southern Africa, we have Zimbabwe, because the Zimbabwe government is not good terms with American government, and it is working with other Southern African states in joint operations, multilateral cooperation, to fight for the but because of that hostility between the United States and Zimbabwe, they cannot participate in the area of the world, and they come from the Rosemary. But at the same time, we are saying Zimbabwe is violating human rights, and as such, because of government problems, the officers are not being trained to improve human rights situation in Zimbabwe, which means they cannot even participate in the yeah. building of our yeah. And as a result, it creates problems between other nations in the southern region with Zimbabwe as a result of American policy towards them. Yeah. Look, you, you, you've articulated the dilemma. I mean, or, you know, it's, a, it's an aspect of the dilemma. Think of Pakistan today. Pakistan is an essential ally in the war against terror. 
Uh, Pakistan is the only country, or one, is, is one of the few countries with, an, with a, a, a nuclear weapon. And it is the only country that we know of that is engaged in a black market in uh, nuclear materials. Now, square those someday. I mean, it, it, this is just a, a, a and, and the remnants of Al Qaeda are now within Pakistan on the, on the northwest frontier province. Now, you know, how do you balance this? You know, it's worth having them as an ally at the same time they behave in questionable ways, which is your point about Zimbabwe. Um, there are, there's a school of thought that says we should always engage. Now, we shouldn't always do exactly what the country wants us to do because we may find ourselves either providing information or training to people who use it badly. So we have to be careful. At the same time, having some presence there that can begin to articulate, as I put it before, a different vision of criminal justice is perhaps always a useful thing to do. It's, a, it's an open discussion. And I have first a little comment on your theory, and then another question for you. Actually, it's your point, which has a lot of point of view. The first one, I know that eight or ten people in this room actually work for the United Nations International Police Force. I am one of them. And, uh, uh, I know you're definitely right that police, international police force definitely very democratic because uh, you're working with the partners from different countries and that's why the cost of corruption is minimal. I'm not telling that the police uh, effectiveness is super, but as far as I know that in my time it wasn't that effective, but it was very democratic. And overall, that democratic uh, institution, the police force, affects the course be democratic too, and it all affects to the you know the country to go to democracy, overall yeah. democracy, which is absolutely phenomenal. That's right. And um, but my question is, you talk about you know the United States introduced the uh, asset forfeiture and money laundering laws to uh, the world. Uh, what always makes me to understand this? United States is the only country who didn't sign the UN Convention 1988 uh, Controlled uh, Psychotropic Substance and Controlled Delivery, which leads actually to uh, help the foreign government to you know, the, seize the assets and return to the, you know, the country who had them. Uh, but the, like the United States generally does this, like the child labor laws, you know, trying to implement by United Nations, didn't sign it for many years, but still didn't sign that 88 convention. And as I, you know, I know that you're a very influential uh, scholar uh, to the United States government. What's your point of I've view? I've never noticed that. But <laughs> <laughs> What's your point of view? How you can, you know, push the government for this direction to sign the conventions? Because I know that. I, I've been in Miami Coral Gables. They're investing right there. That's probably the reason that the United States has pursuing this. But what do you think is that? Yeah. The answer is I know nothing at all about that topic, and so I'm not, you know, I'm not going to be very helpful. I really don't know anything about that. You know more about it, and it may be through your government that you can get pressure on the Ameri uh, on the United States. Let me just say one thing, though. You know, I, I, I talked a moment ago about UN Civil and there's 7,000 police officers, and some of you may think, oh, that's terrible. Well, that's one of them. You know, I mean, they're they're wonderful, and you, you too. Are there any others that have served with UN? Look at this. I mean, I mean that's my experience. There, there are wonderful people. Do they from have the authority to arrest us? <laughs> no. The best kind of police officer. You know, I mean, and, 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 and I mean, the interesting part of this is, I mean, these are these are you know, you have the picture maybe of international robocops. I mean, you know, take that off, of, you know, off the board. These are people, police officers from a variety of countries. Uh, and they're well-meaning, they're often well-trained, they're doing the best they can under very difficult circumstances. And, and as he says, because they're from a variety of different countries, it's, they, they do watch one another, I mean, in a way that, 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 that cr creates a kind of internal accountability, which I think is useful. They also learn from one another. Uh, and the lessons that they learn from one another on these international missions, they take back home and feed back into their own countries. And that study, by the way, some of you will want dissertations, I think that's a topic. 
uh, and that is the, 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 how that experience has beginning to have some impact on the host countries that they've come from. So, so do take a look at these people. I mean, these aren't bad people to be, to be policed by, if I were, in my view. For those master's and PhD students that want additional PhD and master's thesis, dissertations, ideas, et cetera, immediately following this in about 10